I'm going to start off by talking uh, a, a little bit about the fact that it's not just birds and arthropods that are affected by invasive species. So here's an example of a, of a bat caught in burdock. Um, most of us who are dealing with natural areas management aren't real concerned about burdock, but if you have bats nearby, bat hibernaculum, then um, an important um, thing to be paying attention to. They apparently dozens and dozens of bats get killed in burdock every year. So um, just so um, now I'll move on to birds. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to talk about today is instead of um, going over like what are what are all the invasive species and showing you ID and, and control and all that, um, what I'm trying to going to try to do is talk about the characteristics of invasive plants and that make them invasive that you need to be aware of for when you're doing the management of them and the impacts that some of these species have on uh, on birds, whether they're direct or indirect impacts. And using some of the common invaders in the area to, as an example, and also some of the early detection species that may not be here yet, but maybe on their way here. And then also about prioritizing. Most of you have very large properties that you're managing and not nearly enough time and staff to actually do everything that you would like to do on them. And so you really need to prioritize. And um, at the end, I'll just cover really briefly some of the management techniques for those people that aren't as familiar with management of invasives. So if, if you have not convinced yet by the previous speakers that invasives are an issue for birds, um, at the global level, about um, over 50% of global extinctions have been caused in part by invasives, and about 20% of those extinctions have been caused primarily by invasives. Now, most of these are actually birds uh, that lived on islands that were killed by, by rats, cats, um, other kind of mammals like that. So we don't see yet um, invasive plants causing this level of, of endangerment yet, um, although we do certainly have um, you know, major impacts on some of these species. An example is a project that um, I'm working with up on Long Island in the Apostle Islands where it's our primary piping plover nesting habitat for in, in the state. It's a federally um, threatened summer? Endangered. Federally threatened endangered bird. And um, its habitat is being um, invaded by a tumbleweed, a non-native tumbleweed that's moving in. It's an annual. And we have to get that tumbleweed out of there before it produces seed uh, so that it doesn't take over the habitat of the piping plover. Yes. So I'm going to go through the characteristics of the invasive plants that make them invasive. And obviously, you know, not all non-native plants are invasive, only a small percentage of them are. And we certainly have aggressive native plants that have some of these same characteristics. But it's really the natives, the non-natives that really are primarily a problem for us. So one of the big things is that they tend to grow and mature quickly. An example of this is the Eurasian bush honeysuckle and the, the other honeysuckles like Amer honeysuckle, which leaf out really early. And because of that, they attract the early arriving nest, nesting birds who then preferentially go to those leafed out areas to make their nests. Unfortunately, with these, um, with honeysuckle, the good nesting spots tend to be um, down low in the crotches of the, of the bushes, and so they're very vulnerable to predation. And there's been a number of studies on this. One at Morton Arboretum, the first one that was done, found near 100% mortality for the birds that nested, that nested there. Other studies have found that it's primarily the early nesters, the ones that, that come in early, that end up having high mortality. Uh, the other problem with this, of course, is that um, these plants don't provide much in the way of insects or arthropods. You, it's hard to find any honeysuckle leaves that have been chewed on by anything. But they do produce, produce something's wrong with the color here. It's all washed out. But these are red berries. You're probably familiar with honeysuckle berries. And um, they are, and you know, they're, they're great for birds that are frugivores and as long as they can handle high carbohydrate fruits. Uh, but the, so populations like this increase populations of frugivores, but they decrease the sensitive insectivores like the Acadian flycatcher here. Next. Along with that would be honeysuckle or buckthorn. Buckthorn is oftentimes in many of the same habitats as honeysuckle, and it also does that early leaf out, keeps the leaves on late, causes the same problem with early with nest predation. Um, although the, the structure of the plants is a little bit different, they still have almost 100% nest predation in a lot of the, honey, the buckthorn populations. And one of the problems with buckthorn fruits, of course, is that the fruits themselves actually cause diarrhea. And the name of, of honeysuckle, uh, uh, I'm sorry, buckthorn, com the common buckthorn is Ramus cathartica, and a cathartic is something that specifically causes, um, causes diarrhea. And so it does this to the birds, and you end up with 
um, situations like this when you have hunt, uh, buckthorns nearby from lots of bird poop. And so um, in the fall, this is definitely not what we want our birds to be eating uh, before they, you know, as they're migrating because we want them to increase their energy, not to lose everything from having their guts cleaned out. And we also have the problem, of course, that when these plants get into an area, they tend to completely uh, dominate and prevent other <coughs> trees from regenerating. This happens to be a glossy buckthorn invasion in an area up in, in northeast Wisconsin where um, there was a timber uh, sale and they took out the, the larger trees and it exploded. Next. And probably many of you have seen that situation, especially if you're a forester. So a lot of these plants will reproduce uh, very prolifically, both, next, both uh, vegetatively and um, by, um, by seed, of course. So here's an example of garlic mustard in a nice stand of wildflowers. And um, very quickly, you can go from this to this within five years. And probably many of you have sites that look somewhat like this. And really, that's why it's really important to get these things early detection before they start spreading their seeds. And so these things have a tendency to really reproduce and really take over very, very quickly. Next. Uh, they also often have very effective dispersal techniques. Does anybody here have hedge parsley on their site? Okay, if you don't, Matt, you do? Where do you have hedge parsley? <coughs> Okay, so um, this is a plant you really should be paying attention to. It's very common now in Rock, Green, Dane counties in the far s southern central part of the state and mo is moving into the northern unit of Kettle Moraine and others. It's, um, it's one of many weedy white umbels. So the flowers are in umbrella shape. It's a very delicate looking flower. Um, generally it is about in the two foot range, but they can flower as, as low as um, under a lawnmower's height, they flowered in my yard where they'd accidentally come in because the seeds caught on my clothing. Um, and they can get as high as giant ragweed if they're needing to compete against giant ragweed. So these plants are extremely adaptable. They can grow in full sun or shade. And um, they have a very ferny looking leaf to them. So it's a biennial, just like garlic mustard. But unlike garlic mustard, it has these great burrs that help them in distribution. So garlic mustard has been pretty successful in getting around on its own, considering that it doesn't have this. It gets caught in mud and other things, but these plants are even more will be more successful in getting around. They may or may not be as dominant, but it's one to watch out for. If you don't have it yet, definitely keep it up. Next, um, for a vegetative um, spread, a lot of plants are spreading primarily vegetatively. Um, how many of you have Japanese knotweed on your popular on your properties? Okay, unfortunately, um, knotweed is mostly spreading vegetatively in this country. Um, in Europe, they have one genetically clonal female plant. In, I'm sorry, in England. And they don't have any male plants as far as they know. Everything in England where it's a major invasive species is the same, um, the same female. And they don't have seed production there. We do have some seed production here. We've seen it in some places in Wisconsin. Um, but mostly it's spreading by just a small fragment of that root can start a whole new population. Next. And it primarily spreads on shorelines or near water. It can also spread, of course, in uplands as well, but that's not where it's really of concern. If you have it in an upland site, yeah, you'd like to get rid of it, but it's really where it gets into riverine areas. That's where you really need to be paying attention. It will form very dense clones, not allowing anything else to come in. Um, dies back, top kills in the winter, and, and then pops back up again. Looks like Japanese, or, or like bamboo, if you're not familiar with it. Um, there's a lot of studies that have been done on this plant in, um, in England and here. This plant is native to the volcanoes of Japan. And so it really likes that high level of disturbance. And, it's, and in, in those habitats, it tries to revegetate very quickly, which makes sense. It's great for, for a volcano of Japan. It's not great for a river here. So it reduces both the occurrence and diversity of native vegetation, which is apparent, uh, but it also reduces the abundance and diversity of arthropods. And, and particularly insects that feed on leaves. And then also it's reducing some of the reptiles and amphibians as well. And in particular, one study found that it reduced green frogs specifically. And it's also allelopathic. So even if you do get good control of that, then your soils are still going to be affected by it and still it might be hard to get other things established there. Next. Um, a lot of these plants have, have something to keep away the predators, uh, whether it's, it's chemical or something, something physical like a spine. So black locust is an example that has both of those. 
Um, if you've ever had to deal with black locusts, you know that it has these big stout spines on it. Uh, and it also is clonal, and so it spreads vegetatively, it has big, very large clones. And the seeds themselves are actually toxic. And so it has a wide variety of these things. And it probably is impacting the soil. We know it's impacting the nitrogen levels in the soil. May be putting in some allelopathic um, properties into the soil as well. Um, then we have species like parsnip that are particularly toxic to humans and, and other mammals with very thin fur. Um, evolutionarily, it doesn't necessarily make sense why it would develop this toxicity for thin furred animals because there haven't been a lot until humans came around. Um, but it's very effective and does a good job of um, keeping us away and keeping from controlling it when we should be controlling it. Next. Poison hemlock is another one of those weedy white umbels. Again, that umbel shaped flower. A little bit larger, this one gets in the five to six foot range. It's a much stouter plant. Again, very ferny like leaves. And the fruits on this though are little football type shaped fruits. If you don't have it in this area yet, which you probably don't, you should be very aware of it. It's um, starting to spread in the southwestern state counties, mostly along roadsides, where then it moves from there into adjacent pastures and, and hay fields where it can kill cows. And, and horses. It's very toxic to cows and horses. This is abundant along roadsides in Illinois and Indiana. So it's, it's spreading this way and with good roadside management we can keep this one down. So this is one that it will eventually pop up in, in this part of the state and we need people like you guys watching for it. When you see the first one, get out there and remove it um, so that we, and, and let people know that it's there so that we can actually keep on top of these. Okay, next is that uh, the most obvious thing about uh, most of these plants is that they all compete in native vegetation for nutrients, for water, for space. And um, an example of, uh, there's a fair amount of research that's been done on this. One is on the effect of honeysuckle on mature trees. And this research was done in Ohio where they have Amer honeysuckle, which is, um, Amer honeysuckle, for some reason there's this line where in, in about um, northern Illinois, it's primarily Amer honeysuckle to the south and then the mix of, of um, Tatarian, Bells, uh, Maros, Honeysuckle to the north. This is starting to move into Wisconsin though. We have it in the kind of southern two, two tiers of counties in Wisconsin. Both, uh, all three, all four of these types of Honeysuckle probably do the same thing. They found that in this forest when the Honeysuckle started to invade, it essentially stopped the growth of the mature trees. And they, they used coring to find, to look at the tree rings to see what the growth was and the normal um, average growth that you would normally get every year stopped essentially when the honeysuckle moved in. Green canary grass, of course, is a, a very good example of um, excluding other species. Most um, he long, uh, healthy um, extended uh, patches of green canary look like this, nothing else in there. Um, on Monday, we were having a listening session on uh, the revisions to NR40, the invasive species rule. And we had a grower of reed canary come, and he is the biggest grower in, in Wisconsin of reed canary for mulch. And he was trying to explain to us why it was important to, that we not regulate reed canary. And one of the things that he mentioned to us is that, that they never have any purple loosestrife or other weedy species get into the reed canary grass. Well, yeah, nothing can get into reed canary grass. And so um, he has very pure reed canary grass hay. So if you ever want reed canary grass hay, you feel like you want to invade your wetlands, this guy's the guy to go to. But um, he does actually, he's very conscious about the, about the seeding production and is careful to not harvest when it's in seed. I can't speak though for the other, many other um, reed canary grass growers that also um, harvest for forage as well. So this plant is really successful in part because in addition to the high seed production and, and the rhizomes that it has, it has over 6,000 dormant buds per square meter. A friend of mine did her research counting these dormant buds on this plant. And um, she count, and on the average it came out to about 6,000. And what happens is when you go in there and herbicide, um, you read canary, then those dormant buds don't get that, don't get, don't take in that herbicide. So they stay, remain alive, but then they essentially wake up when the rest of the plant dies. And so you have this new plants that come up. And so that's why you have to keep going back in repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly with something like reed canary grass. Okay, they've done a little bit of research on what species use reed canary. And this research was done at UW-La Crosse in, uh, by the, uh, in La Crosse by Fish and Wildlife Service. 
and they found out that song sparrows and sedgements actually increase their nesting habitat in Reed Canary, whereas some swamp, swamp, swamp sparrows and some other species decrease. And turtles, though, have a really tough time in reed canary grass. It's really hard for most turtles to get through reed canary grass. The landing turtles have, have decreased. Purple loosestrife is an obvious one that it displaces a lot of our sedge meadow species, and so therefore any birds that are obligate to that sedge meadow, of course, we're going to be losing them as well. And, of course, the insects that feed on those, the, the birds feed on. Common, um, or Phragmites um, is expanding at a phenomenal rate in this part of the state. I mean, you guys here in Green Bay have had it for a long time, but it's now spreading to the rest of the, the um, coastal areas and moving inland. And, and, you know, we know that it's really eliminating marsh habitat, beach habitat, interdunal areas, um, a lot of areas that could be nesting habitat for a lot of these birds, and especially now as the lake levels are lowering, we're seeing expanded um, amounts of Phragmites. So this one, um, has anybody ever seen birds nesting in Phragmites? Okay. Next. Um, altering soil chemistry and structure is something that a lot of us don't think about when we deal with invasive plants. Most of us deal with what's on the surface, and we don't deal with what's below the ground. And, but it's really a very important part and something that most of us probably need to learn a lot more about, about soils and how the soils interact with, it, with some of these species. But um, next, uh, there's a number of species that alter the, the, the soil chemistry. We've known for, for centuries that legumes increase soil nitrogen, which is great if you're going to be planting corn or something else, that you want to have more increased nitrogen. If you're going to be planting prairie or you want to have a forest there, then high nitrogen just invites weeds in. And so species like black locusts, um, sweet clovers, kudzu that have all been planted to increase soil nitrogen actually cause problems for native species. Garlic mustard does, another th does something different, where it actually de it kills off the beneficial mycorrhi mycorrhizal fungi that are used by the trees. The trees have, have these root hairs, and they use those root hairs to actually absorb water and nutrients. And, so, and they're very fine little root hairs. And they, they do that absorption by interacting with this arbuscular fungi. Yet the garlic mustard actually kills that fungi. And so it, it actually slows tree growth as well. And they have done some research to find out, so once you remove the garlic mustard, how long does it take for that fungi, for that for those mycorrhizae to come back, and they do come back fairly quickly within a couple of years. So there is some, some hope on getting that back in areas where you've actually done some successful garlic mustard control. Um, leaf litter impacts are, are pretty significant in a lot of species. Buckthorn is really high in nitrogen and in pH, as are garlic mustard and a number of other species. There's a lot of research that's been done by Liam Hennigan down in the Chicago area where he's been looking at the interactions of buckthorn with soils and earthworms and deer and finding that they all kind of feed on each other. And so the high, high nitrogen litter from buckthorn breaks down very quickly, even if it's mixed in with the, with the canopy litter from oaks or, or maples, it breaks them down as well. So normally an oak, tr oak leaf would stay in the litter for up to like three years. But when it's mixed in with the high nitrogen buckthorn, then it breaks down very quickly, and usually sometime by the middle of next season, there's no more litter on that, on that soil. And so, of course, in addition to retarding the native species, it also increases earthworm abundance. So we'll go into earthworms just briefly, a little bit. Um, in case you didn't know it, um, none of the earthworms that we have here in Wisconsin are native. They're all European. They did not survive our glaciation. Um, for, uh, we were, had a mile thick of ice, or, or more or less. Um, for many hundreds of years, and we did not have any earthworms in this area. And so our sugar maple forest and other forests actually evolved without earthworms. And so in a good sugar maple forest, next, um, you're going to have a situation where you have a very uh, deep, spongy, moist litter layer with lots of wildflowers and things that survive in it, and then the nice organic horizon and then your other horizons, the A horizon and, and the B horizon, if you took soils when you're in school. Um, when you get worms into this area, then they actually pull that, all that litter layer, that organic matter, down into the soil. And there's several different kinds of earthworms in Wisconsin. There's some that live right in that litter layer, others that live in these upper organic layers, and then there's the night crawlers, the, the big old night crawlers. They're the ones that live way deep into the B horizon. 
And so they actually pull those, that litter way down, like a meter deep into the soil, and, and essentially eliminate everything on the surface. So you end up with this hard packed soil with exposed roots and without any kind of that moist spongy area for, for a species to, to grow in. And so a, a non-earthwormed area may look really nice and dense, lots of vegetation on the, so, on the soil surface, lots of litter, you can feel the difference when you walk in it. And whereas an area with earthworms tends to be fairly bare on the soil surface, um, there's a lot of Pennsylvania sedge or a, a few other species that can withstand this earthworm <coughs> abundance. And so you get very little reproduction of species that need to germinate as soon as they fall, like, like the maples, they germinate right away. And so <coughs> we're seeing that the sugar maple reproduction is changing in a lot of these forests. This is especially happening in northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, where the most research has been done on this. Next. Um, it also affects, um, of course, ground, ground nesting birds and ground foraging birds because we no longer have a lot of the soil invertebrates that would normally found in the litter layer. That also affects species like salamanders. Even though adult salamanders will feed on earthworms, the, the young salamanders have to feed on those much smaller soil organisms that are found in the litter, and they need to stay moist in that, in that litter, and we don't have that anymore. Earth, uh, salamanders are very long-lived organisms, and so um, we, I, I don't know if anybody's even studying these, but uh, we'll probably see a decline in our, in our salamander populations due to this. So uh, another characteristic is that, that's probably one of the most important is that very few insects and diseases affect most of these species. And so if, when you have a nice, beautiful oak woods or oak savanna area with um, lots of diverse native vegetation, there's a number of studies that have been done. And, and Doug Ptolemy has a really great book uh, that explains a lot of the, the differences here and where there are dozens of species of insects that feed on, in, on oaks and of course all the, the associated vegetation that they feed on as well. Whereas you have a nice um, typical buckthorn stand here that you may find anywhere in eastern Wisconsin and there's almost nothing that feeds on it. And so very different, um, you know, smorgasbord for the, for the birds that come in at any time of the year, whether they're nesting or um, during migration. Um, if you look at related species of natives and non-natives, you see that same kind of a difference. So native, most of you have dealt with grape vines that climb up your trees and get in the canopy and they can be kind of a pain. But native grapes at least have lots of different insects and, and diseases that affect them. And so they tend to not completely take over. However, related species, this is porcelain berry, is related to grapes and it doesn't have the same things that affect it. And so it ha doesn't have the same, that same kind of um, natural break on its system. The same is true with the bittersweet. So um, the, the non-native oriental bittersweet, it's very rare to see anything that's chewed on its leaves as opposed to the native um, American bittersweet, which is pretty uncommon. And the last on this list is that these species tend to tolerate, tolerate really harsh environments, lots of disturbance, lots of high nutrients. And as an example, we'll go with spotted knapweed. Um, knapweed um, ha can stand really high, high drought levels, has really high seed production, and nobody likes to eat it, um, mammals or, or arthropods. And it emits a chemical into the soil that kills other plants. It, it's typical to save a lot of bare soil around the base of knapweed plants. They've actually taken knapweed, ground up the roots, made an extract of it, and sprayed it on other plants, and it kills the other plants. And so it actually produces its own herbicide. And it's also po possibly carcinogenic. Never pull this stuff barehanded. We also want to just mention some other species that you should be aware of and how they might affect um, migratory birds. So um, aquatic invasives uh, particularly can cause significant problems, especially for waterfowl. And this is an example of water lettuce. It's a species that we're probably going to be listing as a prohibited species in Wisconsin, but it's this and water hyacinth were both found overwintering for a couple of years on Pool 5 of the Mississippi this year. So it, we didn't think it would overwinter here, but it did. And so um, we're very concerned because when it gets into an area, it, this is exactly what it does. Um, it forms these very dense patches. And, um, and of course, the, the existing ones that we have, these, a lot of these plants can cause really serious problems for waterfowl because, of course, they eliminate that open water habitat and some of that uh, shallow water habitat. Next. 
So um, a couple of the early detection species I wanted to mention to you. Um, Japanese stiltgrass is one that we don't have anything like this at this point in, in our native flora or in our weedy flora. This is an annual grass that spreads in forest floors and primarily in riparian areas, but it can also spread into upland areas as well. But it mostly gets spread, the seed gets spread around by flooding and then it, then it moves up from there. And so this plant comes in a seed one year, produces seed that same year. So you have very little time to catch this plant. You don't have that nice overwintering period when you can spray it in the early spring. You, you have to get it that same year. The, the other thing about the, the Japanese stilt grass is that it, when fall hits, the plant dies, yet it leaves this, this extensive layer of, of very flammable grass on the, gra on the surface. And so you have very high rates of flammability in, a, in an area that may or may not be a fire dependent forest. And so this is a species we really need to be watching out for. It's um, abundant right now in along the Ohio River uh, that's in southern Illinois and Indiana and, um, and then moving up into the central parts of those states. There's no reason why it couldn't be here and it will probably show up first on public lands because it'll probably come in on the boots or camping gear of people that have been in an area that has a lot of still grass. And so you guys should be watching out for it. It looks like a little tiny bamboo um, and has a little white stripe down the middle of each leaf. If you find this species or any other prohibited species in the state that are not yet widespread, we really want to know about it so we can work on eliminating it right away and, and making sure that we know what to do to, to, to keep, keep it from spreading. So in addition, of course, that also probably eliminates any ground flora, eliminates any, any nesting birds in that area. Of course, some of these non-native um, invasive species like multiflora rose have been planted specifically for wildlife. Autumn olive, you know, some of you older wildlife managers may remember planting autumn olive at one time. Anybody want to admit to that? <laughs> yeah, Dick, any of the other older guys here? Okay. But, um, but you know, DNR sold autumn olive and multiflora rose at one time. They stopped um, quite a while ago, but the, it's still out there on the landscape and increases habitat. Very, it's great habitat for rabbits. You know, the rabbit hunters love autumn olive, or love multiflora rose because there's lots of rabbits in that area. However, rabbits and deer are not the species that we really have to be real concerned about losing habitat for these species. Lots of habitat for these species around the, around the state. And I know that Dr. Kroll would dif disagree with me on the deer habitat, but I think most ecologists will tell you we have lots of habitat for deer in this state. So not something we really want to be worried about. Next. Um, we do need to worry about some of the, the, the uncommon species. Um, one example is this West Virginia white butterfly, um, and it's in the, in the whites um, group. And it natively, it, its native um, larval host plant is the toothwort, which of course is getting displaced by the related garlic mustard. And so this butterfly lays its eggs on garlic mustard and but it can't the larva can't develop on the garlic mustard and so essentially it's a it's a sink for this for this plant for this um, insect by laying its eggs somewhere where they can't develop next one of the things to really be aware of is vines um they there's been a number of research studies that have shown that with higher rates of co2 in the atmosphere we're going to see a lot better growth of vines so poison ivy is going to be much more abundant and the other vines, like kudzu, oriental bittersweet, um, swallowwort, all, all of these weedy vines are probably going to do great. And right now, oriental bittersweet is the only one that's fairly widespread in Wisconsin, but we have another half dozen that are here or knocking on the doorstep. The problem with the vines, in addition, of course, to pulling down trees, when they're especially in ice storms, they also act as ladders for mammals to climb right up there, get up into the nest, get up in there, and go after any kind of roosting birds. Um, another problem with some of the with multiflora rose, Japanese barberry, honeysuckles, is that they, when they grow in really dense concentrations, they tend to be good habitat for deer, which are good habitat for Lyme's disease. And so they found that high density of barberry and honeysuckle, and this is two different studies that found this, um, have increased rates of tick, ticks with Lyme disease. So you should be really careful about it when you're around areas with lots of barber or honeysuckle. So um, there's a lot of things that can influence um, invasiveness. So you may have Japanese uh, barberry, for example, 
planted around the building, some buildings in your area, and you haven't noticed it spreading in your area yet. Um, that doesn't mean it's not going to spread. It, is, it really depends on the habitat type, on the disturbance history, on what kind of propagules are near, nearby. It could be that that Japanese barberry cultivar that's there isn't one that produces lots of seed, but another one planted might produce lots of seed. Um, there's a lot of reasons why something might be invasive at one time and then it might switch. Just because it hasn't been spreading doesn't mean it won't spread. And so watching something and waiting to see if it's going to spread is a big mistake. Um, you know, learn from everybody else's mistakes and try to catch these things early. Next. So there's a number of vectors for these things. We're really working on trying to get sales and intentional introduction changed with our invasive species rule, NR40. And um, we are in the process right now of revising NR40. And we're going through public listening sessions um, to try to get input from people on what they want what they want added to it. And the first round of this, we put in this, the less controversial species. Now we're putting in species like barberry and crown vetch and black locust, things that actually are sold and intentionally used. And so, um, so let us know if you, have, if you have any thoughts about that. Um, there's also still a lot of contaminants in ag products. Things are being moved by accidentally. And we've developed best management practices that are all on the DNR's Invasives website that you can go to. There's best management practices for forestry, for rights-of-way management, for urban um, landscaping, and, um, and for one of the others. Can't remember the third one now. Fourth one. Uh, but there's, there's good BMPs that help you to identify what you can do to minimize the spread. Um, so, and then, of course, wildlife actually causes some of these things to move as well. Next. So there's a lot of things you can do. And uh, one is, of course, is, is stop spreading the seeds yourself. Make sure you're cleaning your equipment when you're going into an area. If you're going to be um, taking equipment from one area to another, go to the infested area last, go from an uninfested area to an infested area and then clean your equipment. Um, really learn to identify these things before they start spreading. Start, you know, get, get volunteers out there to walk your land if you can't do it on your own to, to do the regular monitoring. Prioritize the species so that you can know which ones to really go after and prioritize the, the areas. And then of course follow recommended control recommendations. And then monitoring is really important. Most of us don't do enough monitoring to find out what really happened after we did that control. Or we get a grant to do control for a year or two, and then we don't follow up, and then the, the infestation comes back. Really important to do that. And then if you're going to be planting with either seeds or, or plants, it's really important to think that through. Is the soil really ready for you to plant? It, or are there toxins still in the soil from the plants that were there earlier? And, or from the chemicals that were used earlier? And are you really limiting your options of control by putting in these expensive plants or seeds? Next. So um, to, I'm going to give you some suggested priorities. Um, for, from my perspective, the prohibited species, the ones that are not here yet or only in a few areas, should be the highest priority for doing control and certainly for reporting. If you find any of these, please let us know. Um, if it's a new species or population for your area, such as if um, hedge parsley moves in, then it's a really high priority as well. If it's in an important area, if you're managing some state natural areas, for example, then those would be high priority areas as well. Uh, if it's adjacent to an area where it could spread, such as a, a, a river corridor or a trailhead, then it, again, that might be high priority. So, so think these things through as far as what's the highest priority for you. So? Okay, so um, a, um, a couple other species that at the first session, somebody asked me to add these species to my talk just to make sure you were aware of those. Um, some species that are spreading a lot, especially on our riverine areas, Japanese hops is an annual vine that gets into, um, into shorelines of streams and spreads very, very quickly. It can grow 20, 30, 40 feet in a year. And it's in the same family as marijuana. Um, so it's got these little marijuana type seeds, grows, has, has these prickles on the back of the of vines and the back of the leaves, and almost always has at least five lobes on the leaves. Whereas the beer hops, or which is also the native hops, that usually starts off with three lobes. Some of the older leaves have five lobes, but some of them all have, also have three lobes. So one to really watch out for, primarily spreads on river, river corridors. Over here along um, the upper Mississippi River, we have the, and the Grant, the Platte, the Little Platte, um, and a number of other smaller streams 
we have very extensive populations, and those populations are also in the, some a few tributaries on the other states on the Mississippi River as well. So we're trying to work on how do we deal with this on a regional basis. Um, so this is why you do not want to get into your streams. Next. The other one that may already be here, and but we want people to let us know, is Glyceria maxima. This is a, a, a mana grass. Um, if you don't know your grasses very well, then just the easiest way to identify this is it tends to form really big, dense stands, and it's very shiny and, and stays green, deep green late in the season, and, um, for, and just outcompetes everything else, outcompetes reed canary and other things as well. So um, let us know if you have this. We know that it's found a lot in southeast and south central Wisconsin. Next. Okay, just want to briefly show you this, this chart. If you haven't seen it yet, it's a good thing to keep in your mind, this image, that this is acres infested and this is time. And so an infestation comes in and in this area, really easy to eradicate usually. First plant coming in, you just keep it from going to seed you know, and you watch it, make sure there's no others in the area and you've taken care of it. Um, however, if you wait and you think, oh, it's just a few populations, it's not really spreading much, and then all of a sudden it just takes off, and by the time that the public starts telling you, hey, this is a <coughs> concern, then it's really to the point where you're going to have to spend a lot of time and money in dealing with it. Most of you are dealing with populations up in this area. What you really want to be doing is dealing with populations down here, so you spend less of your time and money dealing with it. So um, try to think about that as you're doing your management. Okay, Kim, how much time do I still have? You have two minutes. Two minutes? Okay, <coughs> we're just gonna go with this, and I'll skip the rest of the slides. For, well, I'll, I'll pass through all the control slides. Um, essentially, lots of different ways to do control. Most of you are already doing a lot of these, um, and so um, I'm just gonna, uh, well, if you can just, they'll just skip all the way through all the control slides, I'll tell you when to stop. And you guys can read super fast. Okay, biocontrol agents. Just want to let you know which, um, which plants have biological control agents right now. Loose strife, leafy spurge, knapweed, milfoil have had them for a while. There's a, a disease that kills multiplora rose, and it's in the, in the state, and it's, it's best spread by actually grafting infested stems onto healthy plants. And, um, and then we have some uh, biocontrol agents that were introduced um, without the, the proper protocol that's currently in, in place for musk thistle and candida thistle that are actually causing some really severe problems for our rare pitcher's thistle up here in this part of the state. So that's one we're going to be doing, dealing with a lot this summer. Um, there are currently agents being developed for garlic mustard and buckthorn, phragmites, tansy, not, uh, knotweed, and swallowworts. The garlic mustard one is still several years away. It hasn't been approved for release yet, and once it's approved, then it has to go through um, some more testing and then um, lots of propagation to figure out how we actually can get it spread. So keep pulling. Uh, don't, don't count on the bugs to get you out of your garlic mustard problems yet. Next. Uh oh, we're stuck. Okay, one of the things that's coming up is um, okay, well, I'll just talk about this then. Um, is that um, some resources for you, uh, for those of you who are doing a lot of invasive species control, there's a, a great new um, control guide, guideline that's out by Mark Renz from the University of Wisconsin Agronomy Department, and it's on the Midwest Invasive Plant Network um, site, and so it's MIPN.org, and you go into the management and control, and you can type in just the name of your plant. So let's say you want to control buckthorn. And then it asks you, are you a professional or like a landowner? And you say, I'm a professional. And then it will give you all the different possibilities of the ways you can control it. And you both uh, manually with, with herbicides, without herbicides. And it gives you the, the success rate, both in the short term and in the long term, for each of those techniques and each of those herbicides. So it's a really great tool that you might want to try using. So it's at, um, it's at the MIPN website, the one before that, I think. Okay, well, okay. Well, I'll get to that. I'll show you what. Anyway, it's at MIPN.org. If you find prohibited species, species, let me know. Uh, or, uh, yeah, let me know. Next. Um, if you're not familiar with cooperative weed management areas, then um, they are very effective tools for getting things done in a local area. How many people here are involved with the CWMA? Okay, just a few of you. 
Okay, um, well, and you're probably all mostly involved with, uh, with this one up here in the Door County area, but we have a new one that's, that's um, come up and started here, and one that's in this area. Uh, we have one that is just starting to develop in these, um, the east, east side of the Fox Valley area. Um, so um, if, you're, if you're interested in getting involved with the Cooperative Weed Management area and haven't, then let me know. Next. Lots of things that they can help you with. Inventory work, prioritizing, um, getting grants, um, lots and lots of things that they can help with. Next. And I want to just mention um, a new um, mapping system that's in, in place. <coughs> this is the Great Lakes Early Detection Network. Again, this is from Mark Renz's uh, lab down in Madison. And this is a system where you can go into Gledden and enter data on locations of invasive species, uh, both plants and animals. And it's very easy to enter the data in. And then that data goes into a larger database that is shared um, nationally. And if you have lots of data that you want to get in, like I know some of you probably have notebooks full of data, then we can, we can talk to the folks down there and they can try to get that data entered some other way. So let me know if you actually have lots of data like that that you'd like to get um, entered. And one more, and I think that'll be, okay. So this is the website that I want you to go to to look for that um, control recommendations. Um, if you haven't been to the DNR website since it's um, been changed over, it's hard, it's, if you're used to the old system, it's hard to use now, but for other people it's easy. You just go to the regular DNR website and you type in the words that you're look, of what it is you're looking for. So we have a very good invasives page, go and look there, look there, and then we have the Invasive Plants Association of Wisconsin also has a lot of good stuff on the website. 